a scientist, a chief zoologist for the Nature Conservancy, somewhere along the way, I think it looks to me like he turned into an artist. Um, so, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about lenses and cameras and all that at the end. But anyway, please welcome Larry and give him a hand for congratulations. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this is a, I've never done this before until this past year. Uh, I've always just given my photos away to nonprofit uh, conservation groups for their uh, newsletters and for silent auctions and so forth. But uh, my dear wife Betty has said, Larry, you should, you know, pay for your camera equipment somehow. <laughs> so I've started to do these exhibits and uh, it's just an honor and a privilege to be here. You know, so this is just a wonderful spot to show pictures. So I started in photography as a kid in the 1950s, and my parents gave me a little brownie box camera, so you may remember those. Uh, and then I had a camera, I didn't have a telephone lens for years, so I would have this little camera that I would attach a bulb release to, a long 30-foot cord, and when I thought the bird was sort of in front of the camera, I'd push the bulb and it would take a picture, and sometimes the bird was there, and sometimes not. And then I took, I, I took, I probably had tens of thousands of slides, I don't know. Over the years, I started in, in the 60s and through the early part of the 2000s. And then in 2003, I switched to digital. And I've been doing digital ever since. And these are all uh, digital photos, uh, electronic photos. The wonderful, wonderful thing about digital is you can snap, 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 and uh, you get instant results. You don't have to wait for the slides to come back and realize, oh, the film never advanced in the camera, <laughs> which happened to me a few times. Uh, the only downside to digital is you have to spend a lot of time on the computer. Uh, too much time. You know, it takes five to ten minutes per image to sort of process it in Photoshop. But uh, anyway, the reason I, I take pictures, I guess, uh, besides being a conservation biologist and a zoologist and, and loving animals, is He's that uh, I'm sorry. The reason I, I take photos is I want to inspire people to love nature as much as I do. And I figured that one of the ways to do that is to take pictures that people love and admire and say, oh God, that's a beautiful animal uh, or a beautiful plant or whatever. So that's why I take pictures. Um, so uh, let me see, what can I say about these? So these were taken all over the place, as I mentioned. Uh, I could say a little bit about a couple of them. Uh, this is one of my favorites because it's kind of a landscape photo of bison crossing the, a river just below Old Faithful in the Yellowstone National Park. And it's the best time, best time in, the, in the year to go to Yellowstone because there's very few people and lots of animals. And uh, so Old Faithful serves like facing this point, Old Faithful's behind me erupting every 30 minutes or so. And the water flows year round. And the bison seem to like it there. They crowd up there in the wintertime. And uh, so that's that one. This is maybe my favorite animal in the Adirondacks, the Martin. I think they're just a gorgeous animal. And uh, this was taken this past March uh, at the Adirondack uh, Mountain Club Lodge. Larry, where was that taken? Adirondack Mountain Club Lodge last winter. Oh, what, what lodge? Adirondack Mountain Club, just outside of Lake Placid, mm -hmm. North Elba. And uh, Martin's, uh, well, I shouldn't say this, I guess, but the Martins were coming to a dumpster. <laughs> and they were dumpster diving. <laughs> so they were there every morning. And uh, after they came out of the dumpster, they didn't look quite as handsome as this one looks now. <laughs> in any case, they're, they're quite tame. The whole weasel family, Fishers, Martins, Mink, uh, are all very tame. And if you like that, they'll, they'll look at you and they'll even come up to you. I've had, I've had mink and weasels come almost right up to me. This guy was looking that way and I went like that and he looked right at me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do that with black bears also? Can you do that with black bears? Uh, no, but any, almost any animal. Works with me. <laughs> uh, these two guys were orphaned uh, in King Valley, New York, near where Betty and I spent the summer. Uh, their mother was unfortunately hit by a car. And uh, this one was very, very light. Normally they'd spend their first winter with their mother. So this is, you know, to not have a mother to spend the winter with and a den to, to live in, um, it's doubtful whether they might survive the winter. So this one was very low weight, maybe 25 pounds, so I convinced the Department of Environmental Conservation biologists to catch it and give it to a rehabilitator for the winter. And they did that, and then the rehabilitator released it in the spring. 
So that was a, that was a good news story. This you one you decided 25 not. 25 pounds? About 25 pounds. This one was 32 or 3 pounds. Wow. They guessed. So and it was a bit healthier. But they only gave it a 50-50 chance. But they still refused to catch it. I wish they'd taken that in too. So we don't know what happened to that. Hopefully. No, 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 no. You took the photographs of it. Well, these were, they were born that spring, and these, these are, this was in November, I think. Mm -hmm. So they're, what, nine months old, maybe? Born in February, something like that. Uh, this was, of course, in a crabapple tree where it was just sitting and looking forlorn. Uh, oh. And these, of course, are the Cogswell Road beavers, for those of you who live here in town. Uh, they're not, unfortunately not here right now because they've been trapped out, I guess, but they were just wonderful to see last fall. Uh, they get particularly industrious in November, in October and November, when they're storing up food for the winter. And every time they would drive by in November, they were out during the day. And there were two parents and two kits. And you can see the difference here in size. Mm. And they, were, they, they ignored me. I was be sitting in my car, and people would be walking and running by, and they would just ignore people. There was, such an opportunity to photograph beavers. I've never, never had such an opportunity before. Tell them how they eat. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched a beaver eat, but this one's like holding a branch like this and rotating it. Oh, and it's just like eating. Corn. And sometimes I go like this. Like it's just like a, like a corn on the cob. Yeah. And then sometimes they have a, a shoot that's sort of straight, and they'll go, they're just feeding it into the mouth like this. That's what this one is doing. Um, and then when the ice first formed on the pond, they would break through the ice when it was still very thin to, to go forage. And I don't know if you noticed, if you've been by here, but there was a, there's this dam here, and there's a notch in the dam, and that's how they control the water level. It's very precisely controlled so that inside their lodge, here, the water level stays constant, and they have a plat dry platform to live on. So they anyway. make more holes and fewer holes depending on what they want the water level to be. They can raise it. They can they can deepen the notch. They can, but they don't normally want. They don't once it's where they want it. They don't normally change it. But if it fills up with debris or something, then they'll clear it. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes they don't build the dam. Sometimes it's a stick dam. Mm -hmm. And that one they treat a bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell them about the polar bear. <laughs> polar bear on the far wall. I've made four trips to the Arctic for polar bears, to the uh, Spitsbergen, which is north of Norway, part of Norway, but it's in the Arctic Ocean, and one to uh, Katobuk, Alaska, and one where this tape was taken to Churchill, Manitoba, which is the easiest place in the world to see polar bears. And uh, they have, people go there every fall. The, what happens is the polar bears are mass in the, near the town of Churchill, waiting for the ice to form on Hudson's Bay, because their diet is almost strictly seals. And they hunt seals by hunting on the ice. And so there were maybe 50, 60, 70 hunt, uh, polar bears in the Churchill area waiting for the ice to freeze. And unfortunately, the ice freezes later and later every year because of climate change. It thaws earlier and earlier. So it's getting to the point where the females are getting lighter every year and wait because they're not getting enough seal meat. And pretty soon they'll reach a point, I'm not sure when that's supposed to happen, I think in about the next 10 years, when they'll be too light to, too light to breathe. So this will be the first polar bear population in the world to wink out. They just won't be able to reproduce anymore. Anyway, this one, somebody asked me how much I cropped this picture. It's actually not cropped at all. Uh, that's how I took it. And I, I wish I could have backed up further. I had a big telephoto lens. And I, I missed a tiny bit of the, sh of the reflection at the bottom because I couldn't back up any further with my telephoto. I was in a vehicle. Uh, so. Larry, how fast are the exposures? I mean, what's the speed you're shooting at? Well, it, you know, it depends. The hummingbird, where's the hummingbird? Yeah. Uh, this was probably two thousandths of a second. But if, if the winds had been partly in between up and down, it, it might have been slightly blurry. But when they come right to the top, they freeze for a fraction of a fraction of a second, and same at the bottom. So I was just lucky to get it up. That's probably two thousandths of a second. I can shoot with my telephoto, which is image stabilized as low as maybe sixtieth of a second, and it'll be fine as long as you hold it steady because it, the, the camera equipment's so beautifully stabilized these days. I mean, what any, camera do you use? I've been using Canon equipment for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, Nikon equipment is equally good, I think. 
I just, I have so much Dutch Canon stuff, I can't switch. <laughs> Although, this fall, I may switch to a mirrorless camera. Sony has come out with a beautiful mirrorless camera. It's less expensive and has some better qualities in, than the Canon. I don't Did know, I'll see. Mirrorless? Yeah, mirrorless. Yeah. Look, all, all these, my Canon and Nikon equipment have mirrors and they flop up. Uh, it's like the old Roloplex. Yeah, well, it's just it flops out of the way when you take the picture. Uh, so you're looking through a mirror, a reflection of, of, of the image when you look at it. But so the new ones are just looking directly at the Yeah, the new ones are, quote, mirrorless. So there's no moving mirror to cause any vibration. Um, so, how did you get this other bird picture? It looks like you're right on at the same level. You're not looking at it. Well, yeah, the beauty of a telephoto is you can be some distance away and shooting up or shooting down, and it looks like you're almost on the same plane. So the polar bear, you know, was actually, I was actually shooting down a little bit. In the sandhill cranes, I was shooting slightly up. Uh, and that was taken in Nebraska, in, along the Platte River in central Nebraska in the, in the spring, in March. There are tens and tens of thousands of sandhill cranes. It's, it's an amazing spectacle. And, uh, and I was in a blind with a bunch of other people photographing cranes as they flew by, as they landed. It was it's such a spectacular sight. It's one of the wonders of the animal world is the sandhill crane aggregations in the spring. How do you choose where to go to mm -hmm. uh, Well, you know, you hear about, like, I mean, some of these are photo tours. Like, this is what a guy named Tom Murphy, who's uh, sort of an expert on Yellowstone in winter. He's, he's hiked across the whole park in the winter on snowshoes by himself. I don't think I do that. So he led a group of four or five or six of us to Yellowstone in the winter and knew where to go and where to spend time. Or a oh. friend gives him a phone call and says, there's a rare bird over in Lake Champlain. Yeah. And he's in the park. A friend made me a call and said, there's a red fox pair playing outside our window at the farm. So I went over and photographed the fox. Friend told me there was dumpster diving Martins at Rondack Live. And this, this guy here, below the Martin. This is, this is the yeah. Martin. The the bobcat. Bobcat. That's a baby bobcat in Montana. Yes. Where was that? Montana, Montana. Montana. northern Montana. The uh, it was snowy owl was on Long Island, a place called Breezy Point. Bird oh. watchers had reporters in there. <laughs> so I went down, and there it was. Uh, Ray gray owls come down in the bay periodically every few years to the northern U.S. This was outside of Montreal, a little island called Il Bizarre, and there were approximately 30 great gray owls on this little island one winter about six years ago. And the rosy spoonbills in South Florida are pretty easy to see. Uh, this was flying along the edge of a golf course. I don't play golf, but we were running a place. Uh, this is right down the street at, Mo at Mohawk. I mean, at the, what's the name of the ski place? Oh. Mohawk. Mohawk. Yeah. I love that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I then saw what else was a friend every fall in the Adirondacks. And after you bend them, uh, you put them outside in the dark, and they're not, they have to get used to the dark again because they've been inside being bended. So we sort of place them in a tree, and they'll sit there until they, their eyes adjust. And at one point, this little this tree had four saw what owls sitting in it that we placed there <laughs> getting used to the dark. So they're, they're very photogenic. <laughs> you know, they can't, they can't rotate, they can't move their eyes. They have to move their head. So their head can turn 270 degrees. Amazing, because they have extra vertebrae in their neck. Uh, but they have to, you know, to see things, they have to move their head. They can't move their eyes. And they're very cute. They're very tame. And that's and I mentioned the great gray. Uh, any questions? I'm talking too much. Mm -hmm. Do you crop to a picture or do you just take it as you I'm sorry, God. Is it cropped? Yes, quite a few are cropped. Uh, I mentioned that the, the, the polar bear wasn't cropped. I don't think the sand hills were cropped. I didn't crop the spoonbill. I didn't crop the little tropical bird from Borneo. I don't think I cropped the flycatcher. Some are cropped and some aren't. Some are severely cropped. Uh, I think which so the one? beavers were severely cropped. The beavers were, you know, the beavers were quite severely cropped. But not all. I mean, I, was, I had this big telephoto, I mean, 20 feet away, 30 feet away, so. Is that far away from the beaver? That's a normal lens. That's probably my iPhone. I don't know what that is. But this is, these aren't cropped very much. Who's thinking that one? Oh, that was cropped because of the young one. 
There was another beam over here, and I cropped it out. But this, this wasn't cropped. That's the way it was through the telephoto lens. So sometimes it's cropped, sometimes it's not. But you can crop a lot with this, the good uh, digital photography these days, and it doesn't show. It used to be you couldn't crop very much, and it would start getting grainy. But now the, the cameras have gotten so good that. Yeah, I don't think there's any sin to cropping, you know, if it makes for a better composition. I do crop sometimes too, just to get the composition like this one. I usually want to take a picture, I have the middle sensor is what tells me to focus. It's just easier to keep it on the middle. And then when I when I process it, I'll crop it so the animal's looking into the photo. Mm -hmm. You never want the animal kind of looking out of the photo, like over here. You want them coming into the photo. Uh, yeah, just a little bit to one side. This one I didn't crop at all. I wanted to have more room, but I didn't have it. It was just <laughs> telephoto. So, it was so this is mainly the only one here that's uh, obviously cropped. So what are your favorite places in Cornwall to uh, shoot? Well, I love the, be <laughs> love the beavers when they were there. Uh, hmm. uh, let's see. The river? Do you go to the river? My favorite place near here is across the river from Kent. Uh, what's the name of the forest there that we've been on That's together? Right. The, you mean on the, on the east side of the on river? On the other side from West Kent. Side. Oh, there's North Kent Road or... You mean talking about the Elk Boat, that Blazing Trail Road? Yeah, it's that road we've, we've driven along. And Larry and I have been out a couple of times. <laughs> and he's usually, dri he's usually yeah. driving. Yeah. But we've had a couple of times yeah. where, and I just have like a plain camera, obviously, and Larry's just got this great lens. And we're driving him. I said, stop. We saw a scarlet tanager. And while he's stopping and doing all that, I've got my camera and <laughs> I'm taking pictures. There were a couple of times. Sean had gorgeous scarlet tanager. And that was one, one good picture. But because you were doing the, you were manipulating the car. You yeah. were sacrificing yourself to my getting the picture. So the pictures, pictures, three pictures in the case right here, the upper one on the right of a hooded warbler, that was taken. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, that one from the south of the Shattico Cruz? I think. I think it was on the south, north side. There was one, there's one pair on the north side. Yeah. And the Orioles taken on our bird feeder. We put up a, a, an Oriole feeder this past year, and Orioles were coming every 10 minutes, two pairs of Orioles. They love marmalade, it turns out. <laughs> and they'll, they'll eat uh, mealworms, dried mealworms, so they don't like it as much as marmalade. We were worried about the marmalade. Thought, God, these birds are getting addicted. They were constantly coming. That's why we switched to mealworms. They're actually healthier. <laughs> but you're not really trying to chase specific uh, animals or. Uh, yeah, the polar bears I chased four times okay. to the Arctic. So I was. For the, for, because you wanted to take pictures. I didn't chase after them, but I did. <laughs> yeah, just to see them. Went to places where I knew you could see them. Specifically to try and get polar bears. Churchill. Yeah, so Churchill and Cactobic, Alaska, and, and Spitsbergen or Svalbard north of Norway, which is just a tremendous place scenery-wise to go in, as well. Uh, so the polar bears, when, they're, when the ice isn't frozen, the months when they can't be on the ice, what, where, where do they hang out? They hang out sort of in the tundra or near, near Churchill. They don't eat. They don't eat they from us. They barely eat. They may surround an occasional uh, ground squirrel, but they really don't eat. They don't? No, they, they, they lose a lot of weight. They, they just don't want to other things. They want to... Yeah. yeah. So they don't eat the berries or things like that? They may have a few things, but apparently they don't eat very much at all. Yeah. And so they're really losing weight constantly. But they can go a long time, apparently, without eating. Uh, but they need a good hunting season in the wintertime with seals. They're really adapted for seal hunting. Yeah. They need a soup kitchen. Excuse me? They need a soup kitchen. Yes. <laughs> seal kitchen. That's right. There must be more questions. No? Well, thank you very thank much. Thank, thank you so much for coming.